already have them that we cut. All right, so of course, uh, we're starting class just now. I wasn't saying anything about the pseudo Republicans in Alabama. Um, okay, so we have two vectors in three dimensions, and we've talked about how to find their length, right? So, like the length of A, so we could write this as A, A hat. So, this is B, B hat, where A is the square root of the dot product of A with itself, right? Which is just a, a sneaky formula for the square root. Yeah, the sums of the squares of the components, right? right. And um, the unit vector in the A direction is just 1 over A right. times A, right? And um, so as I was mentioning to you guys, we can't, if you ask me what, you know, what angle is vector A at in three dimensions, that question doesn't quite make sense. Um, you, you need at least two angles to specify the direction. That more, what I'm, what I'm alluding to really is what's called spherical coordinates. You'll cover that in Calculus 3. Um, but, um, so I think it's good for us to do an example, just to kind of, this is kind of a fun example. So we're in three dimensions, right? You've got um, a ball here in the xy plane at, let's say, 3, um, 3, 0. You've got another ball over here somewhere, all right, at, um, let's say, uh, minus 4, um, excuse me, not minus 4, this would be at 4, uh, minus 6, 2, all right. You've got another ball here. And suppose this one has mass 1, this one has mass 2, this one has mass 3, and this is at, um, oh, I don't know, I guess it might be at 0, um, 4, 6, or something. Let me make it 7 so you can see the difference. All right, and this is all in meters, and this is 1 kilogram, 2 kilograms, 3 kilograms, right? And suppose these are all connected to a central point, right? A central point by very thin, essentially massless rods that cannot bend. All right? So my question is, where would you have to add a fourth mass to balance these three? I would challenge you that this is a very difficult question without vectors. But with vectors, it's a pretty easy question because, um, so essentially, what you want is you want the center of mass to be the origin, right? So in physics, the center of mass, if you have, you know, n particles, so here's the formula, the, um, the position, the center of mass vector, it's the sum. <coughs> Um, well, excuse me, one over, one over the total mass. All right, the sum um, i equals one to n of m sub i r sub i. So this is this is how you would find the center of mass for n particles. So it's, it's just a weighted sum, although technically it's not weighted. I mean, multiply this by g, it would be a weighted sum. But um, sorry, a horrible joke, but. Um, standing by it. M total here would be like M1 plus M2 plus M3 plus Mn, all right? Now, uh, to make my question more interesting, I really need to tell you the mass of the, the fourth thing I'm going to add to balance these. What would you guys like the mass to be? We can make it anything. The fourth mass is going to be what four kilograms? Let's say. Okay, so I'm going to just I'm going to draw it I'm, I'm going to draw it schematically, like here. Four kilogram mass, right? And I'm putting it at the coordinates. I'm I'm putting it at let's say a, b, c because I don't know. I need to label that point. I don't know what it is, 
right? And so what's the total mass? Yeah, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. So that's what? 10. All right, great. Okay, so um, I, instead of thinking of these as points, I should think of them as vectors. Those are the position vectors. So that's easy enough to fix, right? So what I do, make them into vectors. There you go. So this is the position vector of the first mass. This is the position vector of the second mass. This is the position vector of the third mass. Notice that when the base point is the origin, the point is the same as the vector. So if you're going from the origin out to something, then you know the, um, the terminal point minus the initial point is just 0, 0, 047 minus 0, 0, 0. So that's why I can erase the parentheses and put vectors. It's the directed line segment. It, it's going from the origin out to there. That's when I can do that. Right. And so, right. And of course here, so what do we have? We have one-tenth of what? Um, R1 plus 2R2 plus 3R3 plus 4R4, which is my ABC one. And we want it to balance where? We want it to balance at the origin, right? Which is zero. And so, what's that give us? Well, first of all, the tenth doesn't matter, right? So we just multiply by 10, get rid of it. Don't have to think about that. And what do we got? We've got R1, which was what? Where did I put it? Oh, right here. Three, three, zero. What is 2 times R2? Let me go ahead and do that and write it down. 2 times R2 is 8 minus 12, 4. Three R three, what's that? Zero, twelve, twenty one, okay. And then plus four, four A, four B, four C equals to zero, zero, zero. So right? Yep. So we can we got um, I'm just gonna go ahead and well find one more step. So we've got 3 plus 8 is 11. 11 plus 4a, 3 plus, minus 12 is minus 9. Um, oh, I can just cancel these 12s, right? Duh. So that just gives me 3 plus 4b. 20, 25 plus 4c. So the only way that vector on the left-hand side can be the zero vector is for every component to be zero. So I get three equations which fix the values for a, b, and c. And so we get a is, you know, minus 11 over 4, b is minus 3 over 4, and c is minus 25 over 4. And so the answer is we should put, you know, the 4 kilogram mass at yeah, min at the point minus 11 fourths, minus 3 fourths, minus 25 fourths. And you do the parentheses for a point, or would you want to do the vector? You, you, could, you could go either way, because you can either say that that mass is at that point, or it's at the position vector, minus 11 fourths, minus 3 fourths, minus 25 fourths. Those are two different ways of describing the same physical location, right? You can either say, Start at the origin and go out like that directed line, directed line segment to there, or you can just say it's at that point in space. You know, we always have this freedom, and this freedom is abused without comment in physics and engineering. Throughout, um, your book actually is much more careful to talk about base point and terminal point than you'll almost ever find afterwards. Although annoyingly, your book does not use vector, the vector hat on vectors, which to me is a cardinal sin at this level of the course. Like you must, I will I'll dogmatically insist on you writing vectors on vectors in here. Now when I get into a higher math course, I don't do that. 
all the time. Like I'll just use a plain letter and it's understood to be a vector. That's, but that's, in that kind of math course, I'm also writing this is an element of this. And I'm like, I'm always declaring where things are coming from. So I don't have to use notation to say where things are coming from. At this level of math, we use not notation to communicate the type of object sometimes. So books will use boldface letters to denote vectors sometimes, right? But how do you write boldface on a black blackboard or on your, on your solution? That, that's why I would argue that's a bad notation for students. This is, you know, concrete. You can see it. It's a vector, you know, and, and I'm being lazy, like, like, it should really be like this, you know? <laughs> okay, fine, but I'm, I'm just gonna, you know, is it, is it this or is it this? <laughs> you know, I mean, this would be a more literal thing to adorn um, things with. Now, why do you put the hat on a, um, a unit vector? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, if there's some deeper significance to the notation, I'm not sure. Basically, it's something that also says, hey, I'm a vector, but it says something more specific. It says I'm a vector of length one, right? So anyway, I just thought I should give you this kind of just basic vector addition slash symbolic uh, problem, because I think it's an interesting physical problem that I mean, this, would be, this is something you could apply in your daily life if you're trying to solve some kind of balancing problem. You know, you've got 10 different things you're trying to balance. You need to add a balance point. You know what your weight is. Well, then you can use this method if you take precise measurements to know exactly where you should put the thing to balance. You know? Although, in, um, in real situations, if these rods have mass, then you actually have to think of those also as additional, um, you know, weights on the system. And the way that you do that in physics is if they're masses of like uniform density, you end up needing to think of those as, also, as additional point masses at their, at their middle, because the middle is the center of mass. And so anyway, um, physics is, the physics of um, rigid bodies is very interesting. It's like there's this incredible efficiency of, um, of concepts. You're allowed to replace whole extended bodies as single points at their center of mass. This is very surprising, right? Like, because, you know, for example, this, this bucket, it's a rather complicated thing, right? I mean, it's a cylinder, kind of, sort of. It's got that, you know, extended cap. Um, you know, the way the um, horrible smelling towels in here is, is kind of lumpy. You know, where exactly is the balance point? Is it in the center? Is it off? I don't know. It kind of depends on how they're wadded up inside there, right? Um, but it is true in physics, if you could do that calculation, you can calculate a certain integral that we learned how to calculate in calculus three. And if you actually had the density of the mass in this region, you could calculate what the center of mass is for this bucket, right? And then ignoring this kind of motion, all right, like spinning motion about the center of mass, if you're just talking about like it's sort of gross like transitional motion, you can just think about it as if it's a point mass at the center of mass. That's one of the main lessons of like first semester physics. So, but, or statics. I guess I was just doing dynamics a little bit, but I think we do have a statics course here. I believe one of the uh, math professors actually teaches it. She is an engineer. So, Professor Giles. Okay, so. Uh, no, I don't teach physics here, but I have taught it before. I have a, I have a master's in physics, so I know a little bit. But yeah, a little bit. Let's see here. So um, we, we also learned what? We learned that we can take the dot product of the two vectors. How was that? Remember? Yeah, A2B2 plus A3B3. And we learned that that was equal to the product of their magnitudes times the cosine of the angle between them. We saw that we can calculate the angle between vectors using this, right? In fact, you could say that the angle from A to B is defined by um, the inverse cosine of A dot B over AB for non-zero vectors, right? So that, that actually gives a concrete, in some sense, algebraic definition for angles, right? Okay, so, yeah. Like 
So if this is A and this is B, you're saying there's two angles? What do you mean by that? So like um, when it's in a, the three Bs, mm -hmm. you know, that has the two angles. Oh. Oh. There, there has to be two angles to describe where the vector is in three dimensions. So here I'm, there I'm just talking about a single vector and trying to describe its direction. So um, this is technically not part of this course, but since you asked, if this is vector A, you could describe it, right, by if you drop this A down to its projection onto the xy plane, right, which would be like A1, a2, 0 for what it's worth. So that, that projection, right? If you think about that, then you can describe that vector where it is by giving me this angle, which we typically call theta in math. So it's essentially the same as the angle we talked about with polar coordinates. It's related to x and y in the same way, like x is equal to r cosine theta, y is equal to r sine theta. These are part of what are called cylindrical coordinates. Um, but then also, you need this angle which is usually denoted in mathematics by phi. Annoyingly, in engineering and physics, these letters are also used but switched in their meaning. Um, but these are, the, um, these are some, sometimes called the spherical angles. They're part of the spherical coordinate system. But see if I tell you how far you sweep over in the xy plane. So if you think about it, if this is the x, x axis, right? If I take my vector and I swing, sorry, this is the x axis. So. This is the x-axis. So I swing, you know, I swing over to here, do 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 do, do. and then um, I guess I, I yeah. See, this is why maybe it's more natural to take the angle up off the x-y plane, but anyway, that's not what's done typically in math. So you're like over here, and then you got to like bring that up to the z-axis, and then drop down by phi, and that gives you a vector that points in this direction. So that that's the two angles I was talking about, which are not part of this course. Oh no, not in here. No, no, no. Um, I mean, you could. There's nothing stopping you. This is really, there's no calculus needed for any of this. It's just geometry. But it's traditionally done in calculus three in like US education. Um, OK, so, but I thought you were asking me about, is this angle this angle? Or is it this angle? Well, this one is. If this is, let's call this beta, let's call this theta, right? So like theta is less than 180. Theta is greater than 180, right? Thing is, inverse cosine's range is between 0 and 180. So it, it, this is going to give you the angle which is, you know, less than 180 degrees. That's because we're using inverse cosine. So that, that's what we, that, you know, there are, there are two angles to describe how far two vectors are apart, you could either use theta or beta in my picture. We choose to use theta to, descri to describe the angle between two vectors. You could find out the other one by finding out the cosine. Oh, yeah. You just plot down A. Oh, yeah. And then you find the angle of beta. And then you find that other angle that would be on the other side, not the whole beta. Ah. Oh, you mean like this one? Yeah. And then you just add one. <laughs> yeah, that, that is true. That is true. Um, so, anyway, we have all this. We calculated the angle for the specific examples last time, just reminding you guys, right? And what else can we say? How about when, it, when I say, so um, we can describe when two vectors are parallel or perpendicular. Let me remind you guys that. Um, so like A is parallel to B if A dot B is just equal to AB. Right? Because that would mean that the cosine of the angle between them is 1, which would say that theta is 0. And if the angle between two vectors is 0, they're parallel. In contrast, A is perpendicular to B if A dot B is 0, right? So just to emphasize, this is theta equals to 0 degrees. And this would be theta equal to 90 degrees. Okay. So these are the things we know. All right. Uh, so 
I'll probably ask you some homework questions about parallel and perpendicular. You should keep these tools in mind, all right? Now, what's next? Here's the question. Given A and B not zero, right? How to find a vector C such that um, A is perpendicular to C and B is perpendicular to C? So in, in three dimensions, this is a question which makes sense, right? Because, I mean, I can, we can do it uh, if I have some, some vectors here, right? Like I could use, oh, I don't know, this stick and I need, I need a second stick. I got no more sticks. Oh, well. So if you um, <laughs> break the stick in half, <laughs> then do it again. So um, this, you know, if we, well, you just use the board, all right? So if we think about this vector here, I'll just draw it. Right? Here's a vector on the board. You guys see it, right? And if I take this vector coming out of the board like that, right? You can see that there's a, a, a third vector which is perpendicular to both of these, right? Going straight up, but also what is the other possibility? Going straight down, right? So either straight up or straight down is a perpendicular vector to both of these, right? Um, what if I put the vector like this? So like this, right? And I can draw it now. So if this is A and this is B, where's the vector which is perpendicular to both A and B? And these are not, I'm not drawing perspective here. These are literally vectors that are tangent to the plane of the board. They're just lying in the board. Right, coming, coming straight out at you. Or going straight into you, right? So we got these. You see, every time we ask this question of which is perpendicular to two given vectors, we got two choices, right? So one way we can specify the choice is by the right-hand rule. All right. So the right-hand rule says I start with vector a, all right, and I cross my hand over into vector b like that. Whichever direction my thumb is pointing is the direction of a cross b, as it's called. So a cross b here. Cross my. So I, I need two symbols. Let's say this is out of board, and this is into board. So like, this is like you're, you're imagining that the 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 arrow, the 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 vector is kind of like an arrow with fins, you know. And it's got one of these explosive Rambo style, you know, heads. So this is the the looking at it coming out of the board. You're looking at the arrowhead out at you, and this is the fins of the thing if it's going into the board. So a cross b, a cross b, it's going out of the board. So I would I could draw like this. Right coming out of the board. In contrast, if I did another one over here, like here's A, here's B. Now take a, take, watch the right hand rule. I put my right hand in the direction of A. I, I have to bend my fingers, curl them into the direction of B, cross them into the direction of B. Then my thumb is forced to point into the board. So I, I would do like this. Wait a minute. I'm a bad, what did I just do? 
Did I? Oh, into the board. I've already forgotten my symbol. I'm an idiot. <laughs> into board, yes. So what happens if I just do this up? You have to, yeah, you, you're, you're not allowed to be like no double jointed, no, no double jointing. You're only allowed to right and then right hand and and gripping, gripping fingers going to palm. Yes, none none of the, none of this, and and none of this either. All right. Um, so right. So this is. I mean, so what I'm I'm telling you right now is the right hand rule specifies the direction that we want. So we can say. You know, such that, well, let's add a condition where C follows right hand rule. So I've just, I've, I've tried to describe to you what the right hand rule says. All right. And so the question is how to construct such an operation. All right. Um, how, wh what is, Apparently, and I'm, 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 gonna, I'm, I'm proposing that we call this, this A cross B is, is the C that I'm looking for, okay? So let's let A cross B um, denote the C in this, in this problem, okay? So... I'm going to give you the formula for it. Um, so here's the formula for it. A cross B. And we can check that this formula satisfies the needed um, properties. So what you do is you do A2B3 minus A3B2. Um, a three B one minus A one B three A one B two minus A two B one. This is the formula for the cross product. So I'll give you an example. Did I give any examples yet? I guess this is my second example. I did that other one. I didn't think I called it example one, but I should have. So how about this? We take the cross product of, oh, I don't know, um, one, zero, zero, with zero, one, zero. So let me write out what we have. We've got A1 equals to one. A2 equals to 0, A3 equals to 0, B1 equals to 0, B2, 1, B3, 0. Almost everything in the cross product formula is 0, right? Because what, what, what survives? We need 1, A1, and B2 in the formula for it to not be 0, right? Is there any A1, B2 here? Ah, so just this one. Everything else has at least one zero in it, and it's so zero. So this shows you that this is equal to zero, zero, one. What this calculation shows you, if we go back to the, remember the i, j, k we talked about? So what we're talking about is this is the same as i, cross j equals to k. Here's a picture of it. This is the i vector. This is the j vector in the direction of x and the direction of y. And i crossed into j gives me k straight up. Um, very similar calculations can be used to show that if you take J crossed with K, you get I. And if you take K and you cross it with I, 
you get J. And you can kind of see those like J, see here, J crossed into K out of the board. Yeah. J crossed K out of the board. K cross I, so K crossed into I, it's coming at me. That's the J. All right. Now, before we had that the dot product was commutative, right? What happens if you relate A cross B to B cross A? How are B cross A and A cross B, A cross B related? I, I, if you don't mind, I would like to erase example two. Can I? Okay. I'll leave those. So notice that this is minus um, B2 A3 minus A3 B2. Um, A1, or rather B3, A1 minus A3, B, oops, good grief, um, B3, A2, uh, B3, A1 minus B1, A3, and finally B1, A2 minus B2, A1. So what I've done is I pulled a minus out of it, and I flipped the order of A and B. But if you look at it, it's the same pattern. This is exactly minus B cross A. So the, the cross product, see it's, I mean, you can anticipate this by the right hand rule, right? If this is A and this is B, right? A cross B out of the board, right? I'm going to move it over here so you can see it. But B cross A into the board, right? So those are exactly opposite, right? That's why you get one is minus the other. Is this vector perpendicular to A and B? So here's a good, a good exercise. show a dot a cross b is equal to zero. What happens if you if you do take that dot product? You've got what? You've got a1 times a2b3 minus a3b2, right? Plus a2 a3, B1, minus A1, B3, plus A3, A1, B2, minus A2, B1. See what I did there? This is um, literally, um, ah, curses. Poor planning on my part. I'll fix it. So what we're looking at here is A dot A cross B, right? So it's the first component of A times the first component of the cross product, for second component of A times the second component of the cross product, third component of A times the third component. That's the dot product of A with A cross B, right? But look what happens with these terms. So you've got a plus A1, A2, B3, right? Do you... And where else do you have A1, A2, and B3? A1, A2, here's an A2, A1, B3. These are numbers, you can move them around, right? So this term and that term, same when you multiply it out terms, but different sign, so they cancel. How about this one? A1, A3, B2. A1, A3, B2, see that? 
it's got a plus here, it's got a minus there, those cancel. And then finally, these guys cancel with these guys when you multiply it out because they got A2, A3, B1, minus A3, A2, B1. And again, the numbers commute. And you can also show that B dot A cross B is zero. Okay? So this is the vector that we're looking for. It's perpendicular to A and B. So the next question is, what is the significance, um, what's the significance of the magnitude of A cross B, right? So notice that this thing I just proved is a nice way to check your answer. I always tell students that you can check your answer for the cross product. You just have to take the dot product with the two vectors you're crossing, you know? And um, they ignore me. But um, example three, so here it is, we'll, 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 do, we'll do two. A is, let's say, one, two, three, and let's suppose that B is um, four, zero, and six. I'm going to show you a mnemonic which is often taught to students. So we could use my formula. Like, you can just use that formula. That's fine. But here's a way a lot of people like to do it. They take the determinant and they put I, J, and K up here. They put 1, 2, 3 like this. 4, 0, 6 like this. All right. And what this means is you do I times 2 times 6 minus 3 times 0. See, that, that's, this is the piece which is not with I. And then the way the determinant works is then you do minus J times the things that are not with J, which is 1, 4. So you do 1 times 6 minus 3 times 4. plus k hat times 1 times 0 minus 2 times 4. Now, if you look at it, what you got here is, I mean, if you just write this, you know, this number, comma, this number, comma, that number, putting the minus in, you'll have exactly what I have written over here. So it's just, this is just a trick to remember the formula I wrote down. But I would argue, I'm not so sure that this trick is that great, honestly. I mean, it is because it, the, the way the, the vectors are stacked, it helps you keep track of which is one, two, three kind of nicely without actually writing them down. Um, but about, in my experience, about 60% of the time students do this calculation, they get it wrong on tests. And so if you don't check your answer, just not wise. We'll, we'll check our answer here. This is going to be 12. Um, that's 6 minus 12, which is minus 6, but minus minus 6 gives me 6. And then 8, minus 8, right? How do we check our answer? Pretty simple. What's a dot 12, 6, minus 8? It is 1 times 12 plus 2 times 6 minus, well, mi yeah, minus 3 times. I'm, I'm bringing the, the minus out of the 8. What you got there? You got 12 plus 12, 24. 24 minus 24, 0. That's good. Now, a lot of times, I'll just kind of stop there. Like, okay, good. But, you know, to be careful, you should check both. Dot products are easy, right? So it doesn't cost you much to take a dot product to check yourself. So we've got, you know, 4 times 12 plus 0 times 6 minus 6 times 8, which is indeed 0 because 48 minus 48 is 0. Hooray, we found the vector which has 
which is perpendicular to the two given vectors, right? So the next question we should ask is, what's the analog of, you know, we had that formula I erased, a dot b is a b cosine theta. What's the corresponding formula for the cross product? And so this is a theorem. But a cross b, it's equal to a b sine of theta, where theta is the angle between the vectors, times n hat, where n hat is equal to a hat cross b hat. In other words, n hat is the unit vector given by the right-hand rule, taking the unit vector, like taking unit vectors for a and b and crossing them. That gives you that direction. More to the point here, the magnitude of a cross b is a um, is a b. I guess I have to put absolute value, um, absolute value of a b sine theta. The reason I have to put absolute value there. Oh, wait a minute, no, I don't. If theta is the angle between A and B, it's between 0 and 180, right? Is sine positive there? It is, so I don't need the absolute value. What's the significance of this? If you look at, if this is A, right, and this is B, and here's theta, check it out. What we were looking at, um, see this? It's it's. This has length A, this has length B, right? And there's a parallelogram you can make here, right? What's the area of this parallelogram? Well, what's the height? Because area of parallelogram is base times height, right? What's the height? B sine theta, right? B sine theta, because that's the opposite side of this right triangle I'm drawing in here. So what's the area of the parallelogram? It is a, b, sine theta. So that's the significance here. The cross product's magnitude is the area of the parallelogram, which has a and b as side vectors from some particular vertex. Okay, so circling back to what we talked about earlier, what would you say if you wanted to use the cross product to describe parallel or perpendicular, what would you, what would you have? Check this out. So A cross B equals to zero implies A is parallel to B, right? See that? If you take the cross, pro what happens when you take the cross product of a vector with another vector in the same direction? Your right hand rule kind of, oh, but I can't cross, it's in the same, it breaks down. So the right hand rule breaks down, it breaks down in this case. But if you look at the formulas, when you take a vector crossed itself, or if you take a cross a multiple of a, you get c times a cross a by the properties of the cross product, which I have not written out. But if you look at what happens when you feed the same vector into that formula, all those things zero out. Any vector cross itself is zero. So when the cross product is zero, the vectors are parallel. And how about when the cross product, what does it mean if the, if the cross product, the magnitude of the cross product is equal to AB, that means what? That means A is perpendicular to B, right? So it's, it's, if I had still written on the board the corresponding rules for the dot product, you'd see it's, it's kind of diametrically appro opposed, right? Like the cross product is as big as it can be in terms of the magnitude of what it produces, when the vectors are directly perpendicular. The dot product, on the other hand, is zero. It's as small as it can be in magnitude when the vectors are perpendicular. So the bigger the cross product, the more perpendicular. The um, smaller the cross product, the more parallel. And vice versa for the dot product. The dot product is largest when they're parallel, and it's smallest when they're, when they're zero. And of course, it's most negative when they're anti-parallel, anti right? This will this C could be, um, this, this, this would also be zero if the vectors are like in opposite directions. You know, um, it would still be cross product zero. Um, but anyway, that's the cross product. Uh, now I told you guys the dot product works in n dimensions. What do you think about the cross product? Can we do the cross product in like two dimensions, three dimensions, four dimensions? What would it be? 
if I give you two vectors in two dimensions, can you pick a third vector which is perpendicular to those two vectors and is still in the two dimensions? Like, you know, you're, you're in the third dimension then, right? So you don't have that kind of cross product. The thing that's analogous to the cross product in two dimensions is if I give you one vector, I can pick another vector which is perpendicular to it by rotating 90 degrees. That's the analog of the cross product. But it's just one vector in, one vector out. In four dimensions, this is harder to visualize, but if you had two vectors, there's not just one direction which is perpendicular to that, those two vectors. There's actually a plane of directions. So to uniquely specify a, third, a perpendicular vector from a set of vectors, you need three. If you have three vectors, you can pick a fourth which is perpendicular to the three. And essentially, you just use this formula where you add a third vector and you just stack the three vectors. You can use a determinant to do it. So you can always take n minus 1 vectors in n dimensions and find a, a next one, which is perpendicular to the given n minus 1 through like the n minus 1 extension of this. But that's no longer a product. It's something more. It's like you, so a product is when you take two things in, you get one thing out. There's only a cross product in three dimensions. So that's, that's the long, short story of it. But to generalize these things, to do higher dimensions, you need something called a wedge product. That's what makes sense for any dimension. But anyway, I am now well beyond trigonometry, so I should shut up. <laughs> I think I got everything. Anyway, we'll do more cross products.